Materialism versus Marxism. This video is one that I've prepared based on readings that I've been doing for a book on materialism that I'm collaborating with two co-authors on. And I've reached a point where I was coming up to the debate between Boltzmann, Marx, and indirectly Lenin and Einstein. And whilst I had known of Marx as an opponent of Boltzmann and as a target for Lenin's criticism, I had not actually read any of Marx's writings before. But when I came to read them in translation over the last few weeks, I was just astonished by the paucity and poor quality of the arguments for his, his position against the materialist position on atoms. And that's what I'm going to focus on in this talk. What was Marxism then? It's a philosophical trend or trend tendency led by Ernst Mach, who is variously described as a great philosopher or a physicist. And it had a lot of influence between the 1870s and around 1920. And I would argue it had a lingering influence well beyond that in physics due to the fact that people Mach had taught came themselves to be influential. And it was an anti-atomist, an anti-materialist position. They literally denied that there was such a thing as atoms. And it was opposed by two intellectual greats of 20th century communism, Einstein and Lenin. Now, I'm not going to go on to Lenin's criticism made in his book Materialism and Empirical Criticism in this video. I'm focusing on the weaknesses of Marx's argument and the refutation of it by Einstein. The problem is that Marx's influence didn't just extend to holding back the acceptance of atomic theory. His philosophical teaching conditioned half a generation of scientists. I say half of them because not all of them were Marxists. Um, in particular, it had a, a huge influence on the way quantum physics was interpreted. So he established instrumentalism, the doctrine that science was just about formulae used to correlate instrument readings and sense impressions. He established this as the starting point from which many of the original developers of quantum physics thought through the conceptual revolution introduced by quantum mechanics and influenced what became the standard interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Within politics, Marxism was reflected in a subjectivist current within the Russian Social Democrats, which was led by Bogdanov. And it was against him that Lenin wrote his book Materialism and Empirical Criticism as a defense of materialism and a critique of the influence of Marxist subjectivism within the Bolshevik movement. Now, why bother with this nowadays? Well, clearly it's because the huge influence that various subjectivist philosophers or philosophies still have on the, the Western left. Mach himself was the professor of philosophy at the University of Vienna in the late 19th century. And his instrumentalism fitted into the subjectivist and conservative character of late imperial Austrian thought. 
Uh, obviously, other examples of this are Menger, Mises, and at its most extreme, Hitler. The transition to bourgeois society came rather late by European standards in Austria. It was one of the great powers under the pre-bourgeois system, but as the industrial develop revolution developed, it lagged behind. The Austrian state had an archaic aristocratic monarchist superstructure supported by the Catholic, Catholic religion, but also had a growing social democrat um, movement within the big cities. The nascent bourgeoisie in these areas knew they needed science. Science was the basis of the modern industry, which was spreading from Britain through France and Germany, and they needed to adopt it. But they feared the materialism of the social democrats which threatened their class rule and particularly threatened the whole monarchical aristocratic superstructure of the Austrian state. And therefore there was a strong pressure to have some form of philosophy that would apparently be pro-science but couldn't be used to attack religion. And Marxism provided an apparent solution. This is the political analysis of the situation of Marxism that Lenin provides. Now, let's focus in on the specific anti-materialist content of the Marxist position. Ma held, firstly, that atoms don't actually exist. They don't exist in themselves. He said the notion of the atom was only a thought symbol for a complex of sensations, i.e. he starts off with a subjectivist psychological theory that science is about sense impressions that the individual psychology experienced. The, that he says atomism was an unfruitful hypothesis, it was artificial un hypothesis, and it was unjustified. So he was attacking at root the whole tradition of materialism from Democritus and Epicurus through Lucretius, Newton, Dalton, Maxwell, Boltzmann, attacking that whole tradition which had always been seen as essentially atheistic. Now, it seems absurd nowadays to think that right at the start of the 20th century, people were still disputing the existence of atoms. It seems absurd and obscene, because obviously Hiroshima wasn't destroyed by a complex of sensations. So I'm going to look at the history of the issue. I'm going to critique Marx's objections to atoms. And I will look at Einstein's refutation of Marx. Because people don't necessarily appreciate that Einstein's greatest work can be seen very directly as a refutation of Marx. So I have talked about this in, in previous talks on materialism. Um, the notion of atoms is long-standing. It originates with the ancient philosophers Democritus, Epicurus and Lucretius. Our best account of it is in the works of Lucretius since we only have fragmentary materials from the other philosophers. In the Enlightenment, the atomistic materialism was supported by Hobbes and Newton. The, in the early modern period, late 17th, early, start, very start of the 19th century, Rumford and Dalton revived it in the context of a theory of heat and in the context of chemistry. And then modern physics, um, we have Maxwell, Kelvin, Boltzmann, Einstein and Bohr, all 
advocates of atomism. Although Newton is mainly known for his work on large-scale uh, bodies, orbital bodies, um, he also published in his Principia the, an explanation of sound waves. And if you look at his diagram of sound waves, um, his diagrams reproduced down below are in terms of atoms hitting one another and passing on impulses. And it's through this that he's able to explain or actually predict the diffraction of sound, for example, from an atomistic explanation of what underlies the transmission of sound. And Newton also believed that light was made of particles. And so now this, you, you'll all have been told that this um, atomistic theory of light lost ground to Huygens wave theory. The next big advance in it comes with Dalton, the chemist, who initially uses it to explain the partial pressures of gases dissolved in water. And he explains it in terms of how the gas molecules fitted in between the water molecules. And I reproduced diagrams from his book here where he shows in the, the left-hand case uh, azotic gas, by which I think uh, is the old term for nitrogen, and on the other side, nitrous and carburetted hydrogen gas. Carburetted hydrogen gas, maybe methane, I'm not sure. Um, oxygenous nitrous and carbonated hydrogen gas. Well, th these are old chemical terms, but anyway, he is able to explain the differential partial pressures of different gases in terms of how they fitted into a matrix of water atoms. And he goes on to explain chemical compounds in the term in the terms of combination of atoms, which is how we now understand it. Um, for example, he says a steam atom was one of hydrogen and one of oxygen. And he had these symbols for the different kinds of atoms, a whole set of symbols for the different kinds of atoms made out of little circles with different patterns in them. And he thought there was only one um, hydrogen, one oxygen in there, because he didn't know at that time that um, hydrogen was a diatomic uh, molecule. Um, and there's a, an obvious similarity to what we now think of as, for example, a deuterium atom with a, a neutron and a proton, because he thought that the atoms were surrounded by an atmosphere of heat or caloric. We now think of an at atom as having a neutro nucleus surrounded by um, what you could say is a cloud of electrons. People don't say an atmosphere, but the term cloud is used when in popular science presentations. So what was this heat or caloric? Well, in the late 18th, early 19th century, there were two theories of heat. There was what was, to us, confusingly called the materialist theory of heat, which was that heat was a substance, a type of matter, caloric, which flowed between things. And there was what was known as the mechanist theory of heat, which was that heat was the mechanical motion of gas molecules, and that there was no distinct form of matter that made up heat. Now in this I'm using the terminology of the 19th century English physicist Tyndall whose physics lectures Marx used to attend. Um, he describes them in, in these terms of materialist and mechanistic theories of heat. Um, you might alternatively call 
the first theory of heat, a substance theory of heat, versus a mechanical kinetic theory of heat. What was the strength of the materialist theory? Oh, well, that's a substance theory. Well, it explained the flow of heat from hot to cold bodies. It was like um, moisture passing from a damp cloth to a dry cloth. And it explained the expansion of things with temperature. In Dalton's theory, the atom's caloric atmosphere got bigger as a substance warmed, and therefore, as you heated steam up, the heat atmosphere around each atom got bigger and the atoms therefore occupied more volume. At least within the British scientific tradition, the caloric theory rapidly lost ground in the early 19th century. The two crucial points on which it lost ground was that the weight of bodies doesn't change as they cool down. So if caloric was being lost from a cooling body, it should become lighter as it cools, and that doesn't happen. Nor could it explain how by doing work you could produce heat. If heat was something that had to be inside of a body, how did friction enable things to become hot? Because what's happening with friction, we now understand, is that work is being done and that work is being turned into the random motion of the atoms in the object that is being subject to friction. And there was a, what was taken to be a decisive experiment by Count Rumford, who was in charge of boring cannons in Bavaria. How a, um, an English count came to do that, I don't know. But he was in charge of boring cannons in Bavaria and did experiments on how much heat was released from a cannon as it was bored out and showed that he was able to raise the cannon to boiling point and boil water with it and therefore a great deal of heat must be being released by friction. For the mechanical theory you had the fact that it could explain the flow of heat in terms of collisions. Collisions caused heat to flow from the hot body to the cold body. It explained friction it explained the expansion of a gas with temperature because the atoms move faster, increasing the pressure. It Later on with um, Maxwell and Bolton, sorry, Maxwell and Boltzmann, you get, get an exact formula for entropy based on it and you could explain the specific heat of different gases. So this was a, a much richer theory. By the late 19th century, the English-speaking physicists, so Gibbs in America, Kelvin and Maxwell in Britain, had fully endorsed the kinetic theory of heat. And it was the established theory within the leading industrial capitalist society. Mont's objections to it, whether they were, as I suggested, and Lenin suggests driven by politics, but or not, they actually had to be expressed in some way. And his argument against the mechanical theory, I've mistyped this, was that heat wasn't a, a conserved quantity. Sorry, the key argument against the caloric theory was that heat wasn't a conserved quantity, that you could create it by friction and you could use it up by a steam engine which um, could turn heat into work. So it was those two observations, the fact that you could turn heat into work and you could turn work into heat, that were considered as the strongest arguments 
for heat being mechanical. I think it's worth reflecting at this point that it's possible that the negative associations that the word mechanical materialism has in the works of Engels and some other Marxist writers may be a hangover from the opposition to the mechanical theory of atomism and of heat that was current in German scientific thought as a result of Mach and his followers throughout the latter part of the 19th century. Mechanical explanations were regarded as had negative con connotations at least within the German scientific community and that may have spilled over into even left-wing people like Dietzgen and, and Engels. Now let's look at why Mach thought that the mechanical explanation of heat was wrong and I'm going to run through some passages from Mach's writings on this. He does it by analogy with electricity. Now I'm quoting Mach here from his book The History and Root of the Principle of the Conservation of Energy. In 1785 Coulomb constructed his torsion balance by which he was enabled to measure the repulsion of electrified bodies. Suppose we have two small balls, A and B, which over their whole extent are similarly electrified. These two balls will exert on one another, at a certain distance R from their centres, from one another, a certain repulsion P. We bring into contact with B now a third ball, C. Suffer both to be equally electrified, and then measure the repulsion of B with A and C with A at the same distance R. The sum of these repulsions is again P. Accordingly, something has remained constant. If we ascribe this effect to a substance, then we naturally infer its constancy. But the essential point of the exposition is the divisibility of the electric force and not the simile of substance. So this is quoting directly from Mach. He then goes on to say, in 1838, Rice constructed his electrical air thermometer. Well, you can view videos of a Rice electrical air thermometer being used on YouTube if you do a search under that. The thermoelectrometer. Thermo this gives a measure of the quantity of heat produced by the discharge of jars. He's talking about Leyden jars. This quantity of heat is not proportional to the quantity of electricity contained in the jar by Coulomb's measure. But if Q be this quantity and S be the capacity, it's proportional to Q squared over S, uh, or more simply, to the energy of the charged jar. If now we discharge the jar completely through the thermometer, we obtain a certain quantity of heat, W. But if we make the discharge through the thermometer into a second jar, we obtain a quantity less than W. But we may obtain... Okay, so I'll show you what the experiment in a series of, of images next. But we may the, obtain the remainder by completely discharging both jars through the air thermometer, when it will again be proportional to the energy of the two jars. On the first incomplete discharge, accordingly, a part of the electricity's capacity for work was lost. So, assume that the um, Leyden jar has a capacitance of one... This is a Leyden jar, an early type of capacitor. Uh, it's made of a glass jar with gold foil on the inside and outside. It can be charged up to very high voltages, thousands of volts, and will hold charge. 
This is a rice electrothermometer, which basically works by having a platinum wire, which heats up, heats the air in the in the, the globe here, and then um, the expansion of the air is measured in a sort of barometer on this slope here. Suppose the you have a one nanofarad Leyden jar, which is roughly the sort of scale that, uh, of capacitance that a Leyden jar has. We charge it to 10,000 volts. The charge on the jar will then be um, uh, 10 to the minus 5 coulombs, and the energy dissipated through the electrothermometer would be about 1,000 joules. So this is just a simple experiment. We then do the second sequence of actions where we have one jar, connect it to a second jar, and then discharge each of these through an electrothermometer. The initial voltage is going to halve when you share the charge across two, um, and because of the 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 square relationship between voltage and energy, the effect is that you've reduced the energy that is dissipated to a quarter. Now, it appears that 750 joules has vanished when you do that. It helps, though, to view this as a modern circuit diagram. Notate, circuit notation wasn't in general use when Mark was writing. So suppose we have a high volt supply here, we close switch zero and charge capacitor one up. You then dissipate the energy through resistance two and measure the heat increase of the resistor. That gives you how much energy has been released. Allow the system to cool down and repeat the process. Again, charge the capacitor one. This time you then close switch one and allow charge to flow into the capacitor two and you can measure the, the heat released here. And you switch these and you get heat, heat released in these ones. Now, if we didn't measure the heat released in R1, we'd have a, an experiment similar to the Coulomb one, but we would note that in the first case, the amount of heat released through R1 was greater than the sum of the heat released through R2 and R3 when we repeated the experiment sharing the charge, and it would therefore appear that electricity wasn't conserved. And Mark is saying that it was just an accident. Um, that Coulomb's experiment was done first. If uh, Rice's apparatus had been discovered first and we defined electricity in terms of energy, then we would have seen that an electric transfer between capacitors was non-conservative and therefore we would have no basis for believing in the conservation of electricity as you shared it between capacitors. And he then compares the apparent loss of electricity that would have appeared in, in an alternative history of science with the non-conservation of heat that is observed in a steam engine. Well, obviously, steam engines were venting around the same time. His conclusion was that current electrostatics recognize that a given amount of charge could represent different quantities of energy depending on the potential at which it was stored. But by analogy, you could say the same thing about caloric. Now, this seems very odd to us now. But he says that a given amount of caloric could be considered as containing different quantities of energy depending on the potential at which the caloric was stored. And that Temperature then stands in as a thermal analogue for voltage. So he says temperature is uh, 
the voltage equivalent for caloric. Voltage is the potential of a charge. A body's temperature is the potential of the caloric in it. And he says, if science was willing to accept the notion of electric charge, then it had no reason to reject the, the notion of caloric. It's difficult to imagine this kind of nonsense being taken seriously. But this kind of nonsense was taken seriously. This kind of nonsense was such that the physics community in Germany and Austria rejected Boltzmann throughout his lifetime and drove him to suicide. But let's look at Marx's arguments in a little more detail and see why they are nonsense. Let's look at the first one that when he's talking about Coulomb. Is if we ascribe this effect to a substance, then we infer naturally its constancy. But the essential point of the exposition is the divisibility of the electric force and not the simile of substance. You've got to notice he's hedging his bets here. He's not even agreeing that the electric charge is something substantially, since that's just a simile, because he thinks all scientific theories are just symbols by which we organise our sense impressions. He says that all that's real is the divisibility of the electric force. The notion of charge is just a simile we use to understand the division of electric force. Now, does that hold up? This is in keeping with his general view of what science is which is that science is about correlations between instruments, correlations between measurements of instruments, rather than about discovering what actually causes the dials to move in the first place. He's only concerned with explaining the psychological experience, uncovering the regularities of psychological experiences not uncovering the causes of those regularities. But even within that context, the simile and the incorrect simile is his when he talks of a divisibility of force. Because that's not actually what happened in Coulomb's experiment. First he charged ball B inserted it into the torsion balance. This is what Coulomb did. And he read off the force exerted on ball A. He then removed ball B and tapped it on ball C and puts balls B and C successively in his torsion balance and read off the deflections. So these were three successive readings it's not valid to say this is measuring a division of force. What we have is three distinct measurements of forces at three different times. That's not what... F you can't talk of that as being a division of force in terms of the way in which the word force was used in physics at the time or even now. That's what an actual division of force measurement would be. Forces acting simultaneously on two weights here and here exactly balance the force acting on a weight here, allowing for the, assuming the pulley itself weighs nothing. In Newtonian mechanics, Force acts simultaneously and instantaneously. It doesn't get to be stored up. So Coulomb was right that charge is a substance. And it's just mass Kantian prejudices against knowledge of things in themselves that leads him to quite falsely claim that what was observed was the division of forces.
in mechanical theory from Newton on force is something that acts instantaneously to produce acceleration. Something that can be stored up in balls or in a laden jar and moved about can't be force itself. It can only be a substance capable of inducing force. And of course we now know that electric charge is a substance. It's carried by electrons which actually have mass and uh, can be observed. His second example is also obviously electrostatic and again relates to capacitance. Now why is that example wrong? The analogy he is making is between voltage of a charge and the temperature of hypothetical caloric. But he does this through an experiment in which electric energy is converted to heat by being discharged through a resistor. The heat lost through resistor R1 is supposed to be analogous to the heat sorry, the electricity converted to heat going through R1 is supposed to be analogous to the heat that's converted into work through a heat engine like a steam engine. But this is a completely absurd analogy on thermodynamic grounds because Mach is matching a loss of useful energy to heat, useful electric energy, into heat with the conversion of heat into useful energy. Now, obviously energy is conserved in both cases, but there is a huge difference between heat and useful energy. They're not all the same. Thermodynamics tells us that such transfers aren't symmetric. You can transform electrical energy into heat with 100% efficiency, but the conversion of heat to useful work whether it's electrical or mechanical work, is always less than 100% efficient. That's the key teaching of thermodynamics. So when you go through Mach's argument, its full absurdity sinks in. He's attempting to refute the atomic energy by analogies in which he effectively ignored the factor of the law of increasing entropy. But the people he was arguing against, Maxwell and Boltzmann, had a theory which explained that entropy in terms of atomic movement. And Mark is trying to refute it with analogies which just ignore entropy increase. OK, this is my 21st century critique of Mark's late 19th century attempts to defend the caloric theory. Let's look at what Einstein said at the start of the 20th century. Einstein was living in Zurich here, and in 1905, when he was working as a humble patent clerk, he produced four papers, four groundbreaking papers, in the successive issues of uh, a, phys a German physics journal. In the June issue, and I'm giving the papers in the order in which they occur in the pages of the journal. The first one is called, on the translated obviously into English, on the movement of small particles suspended in stationary liquids required by the mo molecular kinetic theory of heat. Second paper, on a heuristic point of view concerning the production and transformation of light. Third paper, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. final paper in September, does the inertia of a body depend on its energy content? Let's look at paper 1a. In 1a he shows that Brownian motion could be quantitatively predicted from Boltzmann's molecular kinetic theory. He showed that if one makes a certain best estimate assumption of Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is the number of um, molecules in a gram mole of a compound. If you make a, an estimate which corresponded to what was then 
thought to be a reasonable estimate of 6 times 20, 10 to the 23 molecules in a gram mole. Then if you had spheres of one micron diameter, like pollen grains, they could be expected to wander a root mean square distance of about 6 microns per minute due to the random bombardment by water molecules. There's a precise quantitative measure derived from Boltzmann's equations. Alternatively, if you could accurately measure the movements of such spheres, you could work backwards to get a more precise estimate of Avogadro's number. Four years later, the French physicist Perrin demonstrated that Einstein was right. He demonstrated it in such a way that he measured Avogadro's number more precisely than before. And it's worth mentioning, one, I haven't written this down, but part of Einstein's argument is that in Boltzmann's theory, a pollen grain just constitutes a very heavy, large, heavy molecule. And its contribution to entropy and contribution to pressure are just the same as any other par partial pressure calculation. And Pena observed when he can, was able eventually to construct um, solutions, if you call them solutions, or, or mixtures uh, containing vast numbers of one micron spheres of uh, some gum of some kind, that in fact you observed a gradation of density in the water solution, which is like the gradation of pressure and density in the atmosphere. So that in fact, these spheres were behaving exactly like the atoms in, an, in the atmosphere. You had low pressure, low density of spheres at the top, and higher pressure, more density of spheres at the bottom. So Einstein's predictions were exactly borne out. And this was taken to have absolutely confirmed that Boltzmann and Maxwell were right in their theory of height, heat and theory of atomic motion. This, um, on his own, uh, this would have been enough to refute Mach and establish Boltzmann as right. But if we look at the whole volley of papers that Einstein published over the summer, you see he was developing a defending a corpuscular view of reality against what was known as the energeticist school favoured by Mach and his supporters. His second paper showed that light was made of photons, i.e. light was also atomic. So the atomic theory applied not only to gases and liquids, but also applied to light. What Einstein says in this, uh, in the preface to the paper, according to this picture, the energy of a light wave emitted from a point source is not spread continuously over ever larger volumes, but consists of a finite number of energy quanta that are spatially localized at points in space and move without dividing and are absorbed or generated only as a whole. How does he argue it? He derives an equation for what the en energy of monochromatic light within a cavity of volume V0 would be. Let's assume a, a mirrored chamber. It doesn't actually, actually have to be a mirrored chamber, it could be just a a closed chamber with black body radiation. He then says, what would happen if all the energy in the light, let's assume a, a mirrored chamber again, let's assume all the light was concentrated in half the volume, or a smaller sub-volume, V. For instance, if you moved a mirror at one end of a mirrored chamber in by half the distance, what would be the change in the entropy there? And he derives this formula for the change in the entropy. Now, um, it's not, I'm not going to go into it here, but just look at the general form of it. Boltzmann's constant times a log of 
ratio of volumes. And then there's a term here relating with Planck's constant, the frequency and energy. That, that, that's what you'd expect. But this is the part of it that's important. He then uses Boltzmann's entropy formula for the molecules of gas. And this is very well established at the point he was writing this for how the, the change in entropy would be if all the molecules of a gas were reduced to a subvolume. And this is standard thermodynamic Boltzmann thermodynamics. Again, Boltzmann's constant natural log, the ratio of the, the volumes by n is the number of gas molecules. So he the the change in entropy, the formula for the change of entropy is functionally identical to the change in entropy for light energy, they both follow the same form. So he concludes, since they follow the same entropy law, they must both be particulate. At the, and this quantity n in the light case will correspond to the, the number of photons, which you get from the previous formula. The equation shows, this is Einstein again, the equation shows that the entropy of monochromatic radiation of sufficiently low density varies with volume according to the same law of entropy as an ideal gas or that of a dilute solution. So, he has concluded that light itself must be particulate and the important point He's done it by using the maths of Boltzmann, who was Mach's arc rival. In both cases, his argument relies on the theories of Maxwell and Boltzmann. And he derives from these an absolutely new set of predictions whose empirical testing in the following years validated Boltzmann against Mach. In particular, he gives a formula for the photoelectric effect. Now, photoelectric effect seems something obscure at the time he was writing, but whenever you take an image with a modern camera phone, you're using the photoelectric effect. You're using the release of um, electrons in the semiconductor of the uh, camera sensor when they're hit by light rays. And if you attempt to use a modern semiconductor camera under low light intensities and look at the image you get, for instance, taking an, a, a photograph of a sky under moonlit light with a, a, a short exposure, you will see a speckle pattern. And that speckle pattern is shot noise caused by the variation in the number of photons arriving, which is not smoothed out as it is under bright light. When you're work, working with high quality cameras, it is this shot noise of the photoelectric effect which sets the limit to the number of bits of accuracy that it's worth putting into your um, analog to digital converters. The final papers lead the way to his formula e equals mc squared, uh, which establishes that the energy and matter are interconvertible, that matter can be converted into energy, and this is the final blow to the Marcus attempt to explain physics without matter, since energy itself is shown to derive from matter.